Hi everyone. In this video, I'd like to talk to you about the concept of reception analysis as a uh, portion of critical media studies. Uh, and with this video, if you're following along the progression of these videos, we've, we're taking a little bit of a turn away from some, uh, the per perspective of individual groups or the organizational creation of these things and really focusing in on, uh, the audience and their, um, uh, role in this whole, uh, avenue of, of critical media studies. So reception analysis is starting our, our look down that avenue of things in the audience in this whole, uh, in this whole crazy game of critical media studies. So let's take a look at reception analysis. First of all, reception analysis examines the role of the audience in the process of meaning making in the media. Remember that all of this is really interpretive and that's where we uh, start to focus on the audience that um, when we study any kind of media or when we take in any kind of media that it's really an interpretive process dependent on especially looking at reception analysis here the the role of the audience in interpreting and then making meaning out of that media examining exactly what that means there are a variety of related theories um, to reception analysis that we're going to take a quick look at some of these and then spend a little more time in others. But in the early days, um, <clears throat> reception analysis really focused on uh, or centered around what's called the hypodermic needle approach. A hypodermic needle approach meaning that media really is just injected into our brains essentially and that, that you know, really doesn't um, take into account the complexity of the human mind and the various interpretations of that media. But we're really just saying that the that media is, is kind of pushed into our uh, consciousness and we just accept it mindlessly. That's sort of the hypodermic needle approach that media serves to relay that information and then we take it in. And that's really to just kind of, again, like a needle just kind of shoots that directly into our brain. We very quickly progressed kind of past this approach with the idea of, of there's really more to it um, than that and what's called the two-step flow approach the two-step flow approach so where the hypodermic needle approach said you know media is just pushed directly into the individual and that's it uh, the two-step flow approach added an additional layer of what they call opinion leaders so it says that media really goes to these opinion leaders who are prominent people in the society who are who are the people that that other individuals kind of follow along with it to a certain extent they take their cue from them now this could be you know in our modern day it could be celebrities and things like that we think of those people as opinion leaders but there's also a lot of other opinion leaders or what we would call significant others in the development of our ideas and things. So when you're a child, for example, your parents would be very strong opinion leaders or community leaders, people that you really look up to would be opinion leaders. So when they see something in the media or take this in, their stance really does affect yours. It doesn't mean that the individual automatically just goes along with that. Again, we're not mindless zombies just doing whatever people tell us necessarily, but but we are more inclined to follow the lead of those opinion leaders. Um, and so two-step flow approach inserts that additional layer uh, between people and, uh, and the media, the individuals and the media. We also get into what we call cultivation analysis, which really emphasized and focused initially on the idea of violence in the media. The, the, you know, the, the kind of most common example of cultivation analysis is that the belief was that when children watch violence in the media, it causes them to be violent, right? That that was sort of the cause or the identified as the reason for why there was an increasing amount, what they considered an increasing amount of violence in young people was that because they were watching more violence on TV and that gave them the idea that, well, the world is a violent place. So, um, you know, it also goes to the idea of, of uh, when we see on the news media constantly stories about um, break-ins or, or, you know, uh, holdups and things on the street, people being mugged on the street, then we start to be behave in a more fearful manner because it, it cultivates that fear in us from seeing that on the media, whether it's in the news or whether it's on these violent um, TV shows or just TV shows in general. When we watch shows that feature people being robbed and murdered, that we start to believe that's kind of the norm of the world. It cultivates that belief in us. But um, so cultivation analysis was a factor in studying the uh, impact of uh, media on the audience or the audience's role in how we interpret these things and that, uh, that if we see that constantly in the media, then we start to believe that's the reality of the world. Another a really kind of more modern um, thinking about reception analysis or, or theory that informs reception analysis, I should say, is what we call agenda setting theory. And this is, you know, to, to broadly categorize it, it's the idea that the media does not tell us what to think, 
like it does in the hypodermic needle approach, right? In the hypodermic needle approach, the, the media is really telling us what to think. It's, it's providing those thoughts and putting them in our head. Agenda setting theory says that the media doesn't tell us what to think. It tells us what to think about or it informs heavily what we think about, um, which is interesting. And there is sort of this triangular uh, aspect to it, as you can see here, <clears throat> that we have uh, our own perception of reality that's based on our reality, what we see in the world, what we experience, those types of things. But then we also have, and, and the media is informed by what they choose to put in front of us. We'll get into this in a little more, but, but the media makes choices. They can't tell us about everything that happens all over the world and can't tell us about hap what happens every day in our own personal lives, right? So they have to pick and choose and they set the agenda. What are they going to talk about? And then that kind of informs us about, oh, well, this must be important. If they're talking about it on the news or if this is what's being featured in movies and, and television shows and things, then it must be important. So it sets that agenda for what are we going to think about? And what's going to occupy that, that, you know, space in our mind that we reserve for processing information, right? So we not only have the reality that comes to us through our own world, but the reality that then is filtered through the media who chooses then what to talk about. Again, selection, omission, and framing of stories. We'll talk about this in just a second, a little more detail, but, but it goes through those processes and then kind of tells us, you know, oh, these are the things that we should be focusing on. So we have these dual influences, not only the reality itself, but then the reality of what um, the media is telling us is important and, and what we should be focusing on. Next, you have uses and gratification theory, and this is uh, this posits that people will pursue media that that um, uh, provides them with pleasure, that gives them pleasure, right? That that things that we enjoy or things that we feel like are important to us, things that we feel like will have uh, a, a strong impact on our lives and have, you know, the ability to to influence our lives in in whatever way. So, the uses and gratification theory says that people will use and seek out media that performs those functions and kind of exclude others. Right, that will that will focus in on on certain media, um, whether that's a media platform uh, or a media uh, channel, like a specific TV show or television channel, um, that that we feel is especially uh, important to us in terms of either uh, providing us with enjoyment or with uh, functional information that we can use to better our lives, and that that people will naturally gravitate toward those things and exclude others. These are all just, I went through these pretty quickly because they're kind of a hodgepodge of, of different uh, theories that provide the foundation for reception analysis and inform some of these other theories, but really want to focus and spend a little more time uh, on some of these other areas uh, more specifically. So the first one we're going to take a look at is was developed by Stuart Hall in, uh, in some work that he published in 1973 that focuses on kind of the encoding and decoding process and the impact that the audience has on that process and, and that um, the way that the audience influences those things. So it starts with, you know, on the, on the uh, kind of the creator side, the organizational or creator side of things and says, okay, the, the organizations or the people who are creating this media have a specific framework of knowledge, um, meaning their experiences, their beliefs, their values, their cultures, so forth that create kind of who they are. Then also their relations of production. So what kind of media is this that will influence the type of uh, thing that they're sharing with us? And then the technical infrastructure that they have through which they provide that media. So the, the, the organization or the creator of this um, media, this artifact has those specific things going on. Then they engage in a process of what's called encoding. They have to decide how to share that information with us, right? So, um, so they're, they're creating meaning in the way that they choose to, to share this again, through technological aspects. Is this going to be a video? Is it going to be a written article? Is it going to be a book? Is it, you know, long form, short form? So they're making choices about encoding there. What kind of language are they going to use in, in, uh, in presenting this material and, and sharing this information and, or, or what kind of visual um, choices will they make? What kind of symbols are they going to use? That's what we call encoding, right? So they're, they're making all these choices as to how they're going to convey this information. Um, and those choices have meanings. They're, they're, choosing some things and excluding others and, and doing so in, in a conscious or subconscious way that, um, that provides that, uh, that meaning in how they choose to encode this information. At the same time, on the other side of the world here, you have the audience, right? You have the audience who is, has their own framework of knowledge. They have their own things going on, their own experiences, their own uh, cultures, their own backgrounds, their own beliefs, values, attitudes, those types of things. 
then they also have a, a, a relation uh, of production. How are they, how are they taking this in and how are they processing it? Right. And their own technical infrastructure. And we know that different people have access to different types of technology. So those are important things that are happening on the audience side of things. Then the audience is going through what we call the decoding process. The, the content creator chose ways to convey this information, the symbology, right? The language and the, the images that they choose and the technology that they choose to use to convey this information. On the other side, the audience is decoding, trying to understand, first of all, what's the language being used here? What are these symbols? And then what do they mean? And is there some deeper meaning? Right. So what do they mean on the surface? Uh, you know, what is that? Is that a cow? Is that a dog? Is it a car? Is it whatever? And then what does that mean? Why did the audience, why did the creator choose that particular thing? How does that all work together? Why did they choose this word instead of some others? And uh, how does that influence my thinking? So the audience themselves is creating meaning or have that meaning structures, the second type of meaning structure, right? So we have the encoding, creating meaning structure on the creator side and the decoding, creating uh, structure on the audience side. And then those combine to create that, that program as meaningful discourse, right? And program as meaningful discourse. So, so the, the combined efforts there between the encoding, the decoding, and all the various frameworks of knowledge at play for, for the creator and the audience combine to create that program as meaningful discourse. And then it comes back again, uh, that creates, it's kind of cyclical that creates a new uh, framework of knowledge for both the audience and the creator. And, and they're influenced by that for the next round of encoding and decoding and so forth. Right. So this is Stuart Hall's idea of encoding and decoding loan. This creates a really important foundation for some of the work that's to follow. For example, uh, then you have a, a gentleman named John Fisk who kind of expanded on Hall's work and said, okay, yeah, great. We have, I agree. We have the framework of knowledge from the, the organizer and the creator side, right? And they encode, they make choices that encode that information. We also have this idea of program is meaningful discourse. Fisk is following along with all this saying, yep, yep, yep. Check, check, check. I love all this stuff. Um, and the audience is in fact decoding and creating that second type of meaning structure. But then he diverges from Hall and says that, but there's more to this decoding than just, you know, it's not as simple as the audience as a whole has one framework of knowledge. In truth, the audience has uh, multiple meanings because the audience also has multiple frameworks of knowledge and different things. So each person or group that is receiving this information has their own framework of knowledge. And that as a result creates these various meanings so that on the audience side of things, you have multiple meanings being created from a single artifact because everyone's going to interpret it differently, right? That's interesting. That makes sense. I think that logically that follows along. We know that each person, their framework of knowledge is very individualized. And so, um, that, that does, uh, you know, that, that tracks, I think that makes sense. Then you have this idea of though, uh, you know, um, uh, Celeste Condit, who's another researcher came along after Fisk and said, okay, you know, I'm sort of buying this. I, I understand this and I agree with what Fisk is saying here. However, the structure in this model still really implies and really um, uh, is applicable to what we would call a dominant um, culture base, right? Um, that people, this is, this is being created by a specific, uh, you know, this, that dominant culture. We've talked about that before that, you know, really media historically has been created by heterosexual white men because they have the power in the structure and they're, they have the ownership of the media organizations and so forth. So the, the vast majority of media that comes to us comes from that, that, uh, that culture group, right? The dominant power group of heterosexual white men and is influenced by that. And so it has meaning in particular for that same group, or especially, you know, it's particularly heterosexual white men, uh, but then you could get into, you know, that would have one meaning, probably one meaning group. And then another meaning group is probably dominantly um, white women, because um, they can at least relate to the, the, uh, a lot of the aspects of the, the, uh, the, of white people being the dominant power group and, and having the, the power to create that media and so forth. So they, they're going to have a more meaning, uh, and more understanding. It's going to relate more to them than it would for what, what, uh, what Condit called the marginalized audience, right? So what about, uh, minorities, you know, what about, what about, um, African-Americans and Hispanics who, again, when the predominance of media is, 
created by heterosexual white men. That's who's going to be featured in the media. That's the viewpoint, you know, when you add in the idea of culture and, and for example, um, you know, the, the, um, the, the prominent values of Christianity in the creation of the United States and, and that dominate the United States historically, <clears throat> that that's going to come through. But what about people of... What about people of color? What about people of different religious beliefs who can't necessarily relate to the values that are being conveyed because of that dominant power group? She calls this the marginalized audience and they will have meaning, but they won't, you know, if they watch it at all, they will have a separate meaning, of course, but they may not be watching it at all. So that, uh, that audience is really separate in, in decoding. They may not be decoding it at all because they it's not really intended for them doesn't relate to them doesn't appeal to them in that way so so conduct points out that that while you have all this other stuff this is really still predominantly describing um the the predominant group i think i failed to mention this is what we call polysemy and polysemy just means multiple meanings right this is this idea that fisk came up with is polysemy meaning there's multiple meanings literally polysemy means multiple meanings poly multiple uh semi meanings right so um so uh, that's really what we're describing here is the fact that that the encoding and decoding process really results in multiple meanings, even more so, Condit says, when you factor in this marginalized audience who have a completely different interpretation, if they're interpreting at all. So this is the basic ideas of polysemy and, and discussion around polysemy. Um, and and, and uh, uh, so Condit goes on to talk about what we call um, polyvalence. Right? polyvalence, valence meaning meaning, uh, but uh, interpretation, valence would be, you know, kind of interpretation of, of things. So polyvalence has to do with how are the different audiences interpreting it um, uh, just in terms of, uh, you know, uh, good or bad or, or the intensity with which they're doing so and so forth. So these different ideas of polysemy that, that come into to play here. Another, you know, extension of this kind of discussion of polysemy came from a, a researcher named Leah uh, uh, Cecciarelli, Cecciarelli, I think is how you pronounce her name, Leah Cecciarelli, who said that, okay, great, all of that is is, uh, is well and good. Uh, it's also really not indicative enough of what's happening. It's a little too too focused on the audience as the primary uh, interpreter of meaning and and the only variances of, of meaning um, coming from the audience. So the, you know, she said that really, uh, this polysemy is not broad enough. It's, it's really, uh, polysemy itself is, uh, polysemous, meaning there's multiple meanings behind those multiple meanings, uh, in, in that whole process. So she, uh, really described this process in, in, in breaking it down into three different, um, uh, factors here. Uh, well, the first is what she called resistive reading, resistive reading, where polysemy exists as a quality of the audience. So kind of what we've been talking about, right? Where Fisk and, and Connick came from, this, this idea of, of uh, the audience providing multiple meanings and multiple interpretations based on their own frameworks of understanding is what uh, Cecciarelli called resistive reading. But there's also, she said, different um, uh, avenues here, one being strategic ambiguity, which is what she called polysemy as a quality of the artifact creator. So the person or the people responsible for creating this also have their own multiple meanings coming through here right and that's what she called strategic ambiguity so the that the creator on the on the other side so we have those branches as well coming out not just on the audience side but the multiple frameworks of the people who are touching this most uh, most artifacts come through multiple or, or you know have have been touched by multiple people who are involved. When you make a film, it's not just the director, it's the the uh, producers that are impacting, it's the editors, it's the actors, it's so forth. All these people that have, you know, their fingers in the process, <coughs> excuse me, uh, create that what we call strategic ambiguity, that multiple meanings that come through uh, as, a, as a quality of the, the artifact creator, creators then. Then you also have the, uh, the idea of what's called hermeneutic depth. Hermeneutic, hermeneutic death, which has to do with the polysemy as a quality of the critic or the analyst. So, so we, for example, who are engaging in critical media studies, have our own interpretations, have our own frameworks of understanding and, and things. So, um, so we add to that polysemy through our herm hermeneutic death, whether that's uh, through critical media studies or through uh, critics, you know, film critics, TV critics, so forth, have their own hermeneutic death or look or depth not death hermeneutic depth are looking at it through a specific type of lens and coming with their own individual uh, frameworks of understanding as well so 
Chetra really, really divides us out and says, you know, we don't have just these branches on the audience side, the multiple meanings, those branches exist across the board as we look at things. Another idea surrounding reception analysis or another theory connected to this, it comes to us from Stanley Fish, what he calls interpretive communities, interpretive communities. So Fish starts by saying that, that words have no meaning until they're read. Right, the words as you know, words are symbolic. We've talked about this before. Words are symbolic; they really have no meaning until they are read. So they don't really mean anything until the person is uh, it, it, what we would call decoding. What Hall would call decoding. Right, that's where they uh, provide meaning, and then that meaning comes only through interpretation. Right, so that those words don't really have any meaning until they come through the individual who's receiving it or the group that's receiving it. And then we provide that meaning. It's kind of this idea of, uh, it just kind of always reminds me of Schrodinger's cat, if you're familiar with that. Is the cat alive? Is the cat dead? Well, really, it's neither until we open the box and find out. Right? It exists in this kind of ether and the same idea of if a tree falls in the forest uh, and nobody's there to hear it, does it make a sound? Yeah, I mean, this kind of, you know, intellectual thoughts, it's kind of interesting. But the idea that none of this really matters, none of these words, none of these uh, symbols matter at all until somebody's there to interpret them. Uh, and that uh, then he Fish goes on to say, Stanley Fish goes on to to in, interpolate that groups will uh, will interpret things similarly when they share a culture. So cult, groups that have a shared culture will interpret artifacts similarly, right? Because if they have, nobody has the exact same um, frame of reference or, or framework of understanding and because we haven't all had the exact same um, experiences and, and we don't share the exact same beliefs and, and values and, and culture, you know, that's, that doesn't all line up a hundred percent precisely for any per any two people, right? But some groups are more similar than others, right? So these groups that have a similar culture, a similar shared background, a similar framework of, of understanding, will probably come to interpret artifacts in a similar way then, right? So um, uh, this always makes me think then of, you know, as example, uh, as an example that if this news media, especially in, in our current uh, age, right? This news media and how it creates kind of this echo chamber, right? So if you are a CNN person, then, and you hear um, former President Trump make a statement, or, you know, you hear President Biden give a statement, make a speech, or you hear somebody, you know, in one political party, if you're watching CNN and you are a, a, um, a regular CNN viewer, that's, that's your preferred area, then you will probably interpret it in a particular way, and you will probably have a similar interpretation than to other people who regularly watch CNN. And the same is true for Fox News. People who are regular Fox News viewers will probably have a different interpretation of, of this uh, the, the speech uh, from either of those people, President Trump, President Biden. They will have a different view of that speech than people who watch CNN or MSNBC regularly, but probably a similar interpretation and, and, uh, and decoding process to other people who watch Fox News regularly, right? And it does kind of create these, these echo chambers and it kind of goes to uses and gratification too. We're going to go to the media that really speaks to us and, and tends to follow along with our own, uh, frame of reference and our own value system. And so anyway, the groups with these shared cultures will interpret artifacts similarly, not, not, terribly surprising in that regard either. Right? But then Fish extends this to say that the people creating this media are typically, or not typically, they are products of a, a, of a group. They are typically born of one of these groups so that people who are, you know, going in to create the, the news that you see on Fox News or on CNN or on NBC, probably MSNBC, probably come from a group that, that adheres to those values and, and follows those values, right? So, um, so what that does then in Fish's mind is then collapse that distinguish, uh, collapse the distinction between creators and audiences. It's saying that that, that these creators are part or part of that audience. They come from that audience. They extend from that audience, right? And so of course they're going to create uh, you know, this news or create this viewpoint that aligns with what this audience believes because they are part of that audience. So there's really no distinction between, in many ways, creators and the audience, right? Uh, and that so that the audience plays a role in that as well, and that they are really creating the creators that create their media then, right? It's all kind of cyclical. Okay, all of that really interesting in terms of uh, cultural analysis, uh, but we can also look at a very different type of cult of reception analysis sorry, than, uh, than all of that, which is ethnography. Ethnography. Ethnography is, uh, is a qualitative research. Um, whoop, where do we go here?
we can look at ethnography. Ethnography is a, a, a type of uh, research. It's a qualitative research method focused on understanding a cultural phenomenon from the perspective of the members of that culture. So what really happens is that, um, that a person becomes embedded. They embed themselves, a researcher or an, an analyst would embed themselves, so to speak, in that culture spend a, a really great amount of time in that culture, understanding who that culture is, what's their language, what are their values, really getting to know them. And again, just immersing themselves in that, in that culture, in that in the group, the audience in which they want to study. Right. So, um, so it's a qualitative research method, meaning that they're going based on personal observations more so than, you know, uh, statistical data or empirical data. So ethnography is when somebody does it, a researcher would embed themselves and spend a great deal of time getting to know them so that they can understand, okay, what are the, what's the predominant language here? What's the, what they call coding, the dominant coding, uh, as opposed to the oppositional coding. How do people frame things? How do people use language? How do people do things in this culture? So we look at ethnography and one of the, one of the initial, one of the more famous, uh, ethno ethnographical studies that took place related to media was from a person named Dave, a man named David Morley. And David Morley was, uh, uh, is a British researcher who studied, um, the, who performed what they call a nationwide study. Nationwide, nationwide was a program that aired on the, on the BBC back in the, uh, I believe the seventies, eighties in that era. So it was a while ago, but, um, when the study took place, but he Morley embedded himself in a particular community and then examined how that uh, community, uh, perceived the nationwide programming or really how different audiences of them would perceive the nationwide uh, study program. So he looked at this, you know, the, it's a news program. So he looked at this news program with different audiences and he developed what he called three kinds of codes, um, or three ways of coding. First, there was the dominant coding structure, right? The dominant coding were people that agreed with that, uh, the, the program or whatever was airing in ethnography, the dominant coding would be, you know, this aligns with my values that I agree with this. And that's on one extreme end of this continuum at the extreme end of the opposite end of that continuum would be oppositional coding people who disagree with what's being uh, put forth, people who disagree with that notion. And then in the middle though, for the most part, you have what's called negotiated. And this is where most people will fall either closer to or further closer to dominant or closer to oppositional, but somewhere usually in the middle, this negotiated thing where they, you know, agree with some of it and, and, and disagree with other parts of it. But, uh, and, and so fall somewhere in the middle there between dominant and oppositional where pieces of it will fall in their dominant coding and others will fall in the oppositional coding. And so they create what's called this negotiated coding. And that's what ethnographers study. They study how people are looking at this and how people are coding things and, and how they relate to that as an audience, then relate to that artifact based on that coding. So we talked about a lot, a lot of things related to, to reception analysis and really all of those things do play a role at reception analysis, is a very broad approach to, um, critical media studies. And so, um, you really are, uh, kind of picking and choosing and, and, but they really build upon one of them, each other, really each of these theories that we talked about do, uh, and understanding the audience's role and the, the, the factor that the reception and the interpretation of that audience plays in the understanding of this artifact. If you have questions about reception analysis or anything else related to critical media studies, uh, please feel free to shoot me an email. I'd love to chat about that with you and provide any more information that I can. In the meantime, I hope you do, um, give greater consideration in your study, in your uh, looking at the media to the role of the audience and the fact that each of us does have a role and specifically to play with a, a given artifact. So uh, get out there, do some more critical media studies and really consider the role and the factor of the, that the audience plays in interpreting these artifacts.